special guest today, Ross Porter, who I've, his voice I've listened to for, oh, 54 or 55 years, and he still sounds as good as ever. Thanks for joining us, Ross. It's a great pleasure, Mike. Good to be with you and Billy. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, uh, Shawnee, population 22,948 <laughs> while I was growing up, and my dad had moved there in 1930. And he moved there to run and be the manager of the local radio station, KGFF, the John A. And he loved radio. In fact, they, they always say that one of the wonderful things about his relationship with my mother was the fact that since he was the manager of the radio station, he could do what he wanted to do. And that included singing to her over the radio as he courted her before they got married. He was instrumental in starting the Oklahoma Radio Network in 1930, and he built that into quite an organization, and it turned out to wind up with the Blue Network and other networks at that time. And so he was in radio for, I would say, seven years and got out of radio to go into the oil business after he married mother. He was a great sports fan. And they tell me that when I was like four or five years old, each morning when I came downstairs for breakfast, he would put me in his lap and he would read me the sports page. Now, he had gone to college in Pittsburgh. He had two years at Carnegie Tech. He had two years at Pitt. And so he was a diehard Pirate fan. And that's how I broke in being a diehard Pirate fan myself. Unfortunately, the Pirates had some very bad years. I remember one year they won like 42 games. <laughs> and one of the thrills for us came in 1960 when the Pirates went to the World Series and played the Yankees. And I went over to my dad's house, leaving uh, Oklahoma City where I worked, and went to my dad's house and watched Game 7 of the 1960 World Series with him. And that was the World Series that came down to the last inning, Game 7, 9-9 nine, nine tie, and Bill Mazeroski had a home run for the Pirates to win it. And that was always a thrill for him and for me to have shared that moment together as we did. From those early years, I had quite an interest in sports. And I, about when I, th I think I was eight years old. I had already decided that when I grew up, I wanted to be a sportscaster, and I set about doing that. I was fortunate to be able to live in a small town with a small radio station, and because of that, I'd been in a, a radio class in high school. We had done some shows, and I expressed my interest in doing some, some sports, and so the local radio manager allowed me to come on, but before he did that, I was living across the street from the station sports director, and he was a man that was very aware of my interest. And the irony was, uh, Mike, that at that time, uh, Shawnee had a Class D Sooner State League Farm Club, which of all things was a farm club of the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time. And so there would be times when he would say to me, hey, do you want to go out to the ballpark with me tonight? and sit in the booth. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. So I did that with him frequently. And one night during a commercial, he turned to me and said, how would you like to do some play-by-play? -play? <laughs> I was 14 years old, and that was the start of my radio career. We also did some high school football, and right after that baseball season ended that year, I got a phone call one Thursday night from the station manager. And he said, are you going to the game tomorrow night? I said, yes. He said, learn all you can because the sports director just quit. 
and next Friday night, you'll have it all to yourself. So two weeks before my 15th birthday, I did the first full play-by-play -play of my career, a high school football game in Oklahoma City, and that started it. And I did high school football. I did high school basketball. I did Shawnee Hawks baseball. That took me to my college days. I went to the University of Oklahoma. I was on the student station there. I did uh, OU football, OU basketball, and that gave me a great deal of experience. Then when I got out of OU, I had a chance to audition for a news job in Oklahoma City at the major station there, WKY. There was WKY Radio, WKY TV. It was all owned by the Oklahoma Publishing Company, which was the major power in Oklahoma. And so I auditioned and they hired me. I was still like 21 years old at the time. I still had my military service obligation, but they started me and I usually had the four and a midnight shift because I was the kid and the other ones were married and had families and wanted to be home and needed to be home. In fact, I would fill in on holidays for many of them. Anyway, I started at about two months after I started, I had to go to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio for what turned out to be eight weeks of basic training with the Oklahoma Air National Guard. The station let me go, then I came back, and from there I branched out. I didn't do sports for quite a while. I did radio news. I was a newscaster for probably eight or nine months, and then one day the station program director on television said to me, Hey, you know, we do Saturday night wrestling and the guy who does wrestling is going on vacation for two weeks. We'd like you to do the wrestling show. Well, <laughs> it's a hard way to break in with television to be in a, a pro wrestling situation where, you know, not all of it was up and up, but that's what we did. And then after that, they had an audition to see who would be the play by play announcer of the Oklahoma football playback show on Sundays the day after their game, that announcer would recap the whole game, play-by-play, play, each play, with an assistant coach sitting next to him. And I won that audition. And with that, I went into the television business more, although I kept my radio job the whole time. But that worked out, and then they said, okay, we're going to put you on the news every night at 10 o'clock. And so I went on as a sports announcer on the news from 10 to 10.30. And that continued on, oh gosh, I did that for, I guess, about six years. And one night, there was a mix-up in the station on my, on my show. And I can't recall whether they got the film wrong, some visual wrong, or something that was really, really bad. And I, I went home and I told my wife, I said, you know, these guys are amateurs. They just don't do the right things at the right time. And she made a comment that she later said, I'm not sure I should have made and I might regret. And she said to me, if you don't like it, then find something else. Well, I got on the telephone the next morning, called a friend of mine who had been one of the news film cameramen in Oklahoma City. He had come to Channel 4. He'd come to NBC Burbank. And I said to him, do you know whether that station is looking for anybody in sports? He said, I'll call you back. He called me back. He said, as a matter of fact, they're looking for a weekend sports anchor. So send me your tapes and something that I can show them. I did. They called me back and said, we're interested in talking to you. They flew me to Los Angeles, they sat down with me, talked to me, said, we like your tape. We're willing to offer you a contract right now. And here is the sum that we will pay you. Well, I was flabbergasted. I thought I was coming into a, a big market and would make uh, a lot of money right off the bat. I looked down at the figures and I was astonished. And I turned and said to the two bosses who were in the room with me, will I have a chance to make more money than this? And one of them looked at me and said, if you don't, you won't be here long. <laughs> and that, that was 1966. And so, I went in at that time and, and became the weekend sports anchor and 
One of my colleagues was Rayford Johnson, a great Olympic decathlon champion, gold medal winner. And he was doing the 11 o'clock sports. Another fellow was doing the six o'clock. And in 1968, Rayford's close friend, Bobby Kennedy, was assassinated. Rayford took the gun away from Sirhan Sirhan. And after that, Rayford was so shaken that he never came back to television. And as a result, I moved up and began to do the 11 o'clock sports with Tom Brokaw. And before long, they said, you know, the guy at six o'clock, we're not going to keep him there in that spot. We want to move you up. And so I moved to the six o'clock as well, where for several years, I worked with Tom Snyder. We had a real good run. And one time in the first few years after I had taken that job, they came to me one day and said, hey, we've hired a young guy. And we're going to bring him in to be the weekend guy. And we want you to teach him all you can because he's never done any television. He's only been a, a, a writer and a guy who wrote magazine articles. And they said, uh, you take care of him and teach him what you can. His name is Bryant Gumble." And so Bryant came on and we worked together. And that led me to the the situation where in 1976, the day that Tommy Lasorda was named the manager of the Dodgers, I was there with my film crew filming everything for the, for the sportscast that night on Channel 4. And after that interview, I got in the line at the stadium club to have, to have a bite of lunch. I had decided, do I stay or do I take the film back to Burbank? I said, well, I'll stay. So I did, and when I came out of the food line, Fred Clare, the vice president of the Dodgers, had a seat next to him. He said, come here, I want to talk to you. So I went over and sat down. He said, I've been trying to talk to you for some time, but now's a good time to do it. He said, Vince Scully is going to go to the network and do quite a bit of work for CBS, and we're going to be looking for another announcer, a third announcer. Do you know of anybody that you would like to recommend? I took about two seconds. I said, yeah, me. He told my wife later, he said, I set him up. I had him in mind the whole time, but I set him up. And it turned out there was like four days left in that season, 1976. The Dodgers and the Padres were playing that final series. I was to go to Buffalo on a, uh, I guess it was a Saturday or, or not fr Friday night. I had to go to Buffalo on Friday night to do an NFL game for NBC. So we talked about it and said, you know, he said, do you have a tape of baseball announcing? I said, Fred, it's been 20 years since I've done baseball. The last time I did baseball was in college. Well, he said, we have to have a tape. We've had 200 people apply for this job. So we worked it out. That was a Wednesday. There was no game Wednesday. Thursday, uh, I, I think something else happened. Nobody could, I couldn't do it. So we worked it out that on Friday night, after I did the six o'clock television sports, I came to Dodger Stadium with my own little tape recorder. They put me in a, in a darkened booth in the back, and I had to do a little audition tape for them. The un unusual thing was neither the Dodgers nor the Padres, who were both out of the pennant races, were playing their regulars. They were playing minor leaguers. So I had to take all information down and, and then start the tape. And my idea was when I started it, okay, I'll do about a half an inning to warm up and then I will stop the tape, reverse it and start for real. Well, I did about an inning. And when I stopped and rewound it and played it, I said to myself, you know, that's probably very representative of what I can do. I might be better, I might be worse, but that's representative. And with that, I just took it gave it to somebody who gave it to somebody else who gave it to Fred. And Fred said to me, when you get back from Buffalo, give me a call Monday morning. So off I go, do the football game, come back late Sunday night, call him on Monday. And he said, we like your tape. We're down to two, two, two finalists, you and one other guy. We're going to take the two audition tapes. We're going to send it out to Vin Scully's house, let him listen to them. And then I'll call you back later in the day. So hours went by. 
phone rang. Fred said, Vin likes your tape best because he thinks what you do is more like what he and Jerry Daga do on the air. So that night, after my agent had talked to them, we had a deal. So from Wednesday afternoon, when I was very happy with Channel 4, KNBC Los Angeles, until Monday, that small period of time, my whole career changed, and I went to the Dodgers, where I spent a wonderful 28 years working with then and Jerry Doggett and Don Drysdale. You worked with quite a few people at KNBC. Do you have any uh, real strong memories of some of the events that went on then? Well, we had a wonderful group of people to work with, and we all got along, and it, it was just, it was just wonderful because so many of us were, were we were still in our late twenties, early thirties. Tom Brokaw had gotten there six months before I did, and I think he's a year older than I am. And we were together on the eleven o'clock probably four years. You knew he was a pro right off the bat and he would go far, which he proved that uh, he was that talented. Tom Snyder came a couple of years after I had been there. Snyder was a very flamboyant, shall I say, a news anchor. And he was really off the wall. But he and I clicked. When he got there, Channel 2, CBS, had a huge ratings lead over KNBC Channel 4. It was like 21 to 5. And he got there, and within a year or so, he had turned it around. And all of a sudden, Channel 4 was ahead of Channel 2 at 6 o'clock. One thing he liked to do was he wanted to banter with me. And so he started that out, and every night on the news, he would lead into me to do the sports by talking to me about certain things. And we might go two minutes before I ever got on the air. And they finally said, you know, we're just going to figure that into our timing, the producer said, because it's been so uh, successful. And so there were many days where he would walk down the hall about three hours before the broadcast and say to me, what do you want to talk about today? And I said, well, I have nothing in mind. How about you? He said, I don't either. Let's just banner away into it and see what happens. But it was very successful and it was a great time to be with him. I was also given a chance to do some high school sports on the weekends. We did a basketball, high school basketball game of the week, which became a great success. I still today have people come up to me and say, you don't remember this, but I was on the team at so-and-so when you came out and and televised our game on Saturday at noon. And those are good memories. I had a close relationship with with Tommy Hawkins, who uh, retired from the Lakers, came to us, was a weekend man for a while. Kelly Lang uh, started as the weather lady, and she turned out to be a very fine anchor woman, and I think she was the first uh, lady to be a a top anchor on the news in Los Angeles. And I remember doing a high school baseball championship game one time at Dodger Stadium, and Maury Wills was my analyst. Maury and I started, we were taping it on, say, a Thursday night to be played back Saturday at noon, and it was a very, very good game. And the game went on and on and on. It was eight to seven in favor of one team, and like the fifth inning, and suddenly I looked over and there were no cameramen, nobody on the first base side, nobody on the third base side. (laughs) And about that time, the producer walked in and said, Ross, I hate to tell you this, but all of our transmission broke down. We have nothing, and we sure appreciate you and Maury coming. You can go home. (laughs) You had another interesting athlete broadcast partner too, didn't you? Yes, a man named Don Drysdale. Don was just a pleasure to work with, a a great man, a fellow who was a, you know, Hall of Fame pitcher, also had great experience as a baseball announcer. He was fun to work with. He was fun to be around. And 
it was tragic that we lost him when we did. He came to work with us to start the 1988 season, which turned out to be a world championship season for the Dodgers. And he was with us until July of 1993 when he suffered his fatal heart attack in a hotel room in Montreal. And that was a crushing day for us. To give you a little background on that, it was a, it was a Saturday night game in Montreal. And Vin was there. And we caught the bus at 5 o'clock from the hotel to come to the ballpark, which was normal. Don did not get on the bus, which we thought was unusual. So we went out to the stadium. I did the pregame show. He still didn't show up. And finally, about, I think, a little before 7 o'clock, our traveling secretary called the hotel and said, would you check on Mr. Drysdale's room? When they went up, the door was deadbolt, locked, and they crashed through and found him. And they called back and told the traveling secretary the bad news, and he called Vin and me in and said, the worst has happened, and he told us. And he said, you cannot go on the air with this and announce this because his wife has not been told yet, and we got to find her. And they game started. I did radio. Vin did television. And finally, in the eighth inning of this game, they got the word that Annie had been notified, and then Vin made the announcement of the tragedy. And it was it was something, and 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 we've 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 talked about this. The fact that we had to go several hours knowing what we knew, and being heartbroken over it, and still have to announce the game. It's it was a it was a real blow. I watched that game. I still remember it well. It's one of those things you never forget. And I have no idea how the two of you maintained your composure and finished the game. Yeah, it's, I don't think I've ever been more shocked ever watching something on TV before. Yeah. Just to, just to give, you, give the folks a little bit of a background on this, when it was finally agreed upon that Vin could make the announcement, he came on and said, folks, I've been with you for a long time, and I've never had a tougher announcement to make than this. I remember it. And they faded to black. Yeah. You also worked with an old partner of uh, his years before that, didn't you, doing high school sports? Yes. One of the early years I was at Channel 4, a decision was made, and it was not my suggestion. I get no credit for it. But there was a suggestion made to the program director at uh, Channel 4. Hey, why don't you think about doing high school basketball? Nobody's ever done it. There's a void. Nobody in this town ever gets to see the high school athletes play. So the fellow said, well, that's fine. Let's put it at noon on Saturday. Okay. And we'll have both the city and the CIF, California Interscholastic Federation, two separate bodies, furnish the teams. We'll choose the games, the best games we can. And let's go from there and see what happens. They said, well, Ross, we want you to do the play-by-play. Who do we get to do the color? So they talked about it, and somebody came up with this idea. Wait just a minute. Once he retired from the Dodgers at the age of 30, Sandy Koufax signed a contract with NBC for, I think, five years. And he started out doing some baseball on Saturdays. and. I think a couple of years went by, and Sandy was not comfortable doing it, and the network wasn't that comfortable with him. And so they said, okay, we'll pay you the rest of the contract. You don't have to do anything. So somebody was bright enough to say, wait a minute, Sandy Koufax is available, and he was a basketball star in high school at Brooklyn. He earned a basketball scholarship at the University of Cincinnati. He went out to Cincinnati, even was out on the baseball field for a little while. 
And why wouldn't he be a good choice? The Dodgers had gone in and, and signed him while he was still at Cincinnati, and he got $14,000 to sign. So they contacted Sandy, and Sandy said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So for one year, Sandy Koufax was my analyst on high school basketball, and it was really fun. The only problem was getting to our car after the game was over because <laughs> all the fans wanted to get Sandy's autograph. <laughs> he was very patient and very kind with all of them. We, we, we never stopped walking, Mike. We just kept going to the car. And I remember one day we had a game, Beverly Hills versus Aviation. And the game went not one, not two, not three, not four, but five overtimes. And Beverly Hills won at 92-91. And that was, the, that was the most exciting game I guess we ever had. But uh, well, Sandy was a joy to work with. He he was just, uh, I, I think he might have been the most favorite athlete Los Angeles has ever had. I'm sure you met him before you went to work for the Dodgers, but do you have any memory of your first meeting of, with Tommy Lasorda, who's probably the most colorful person in sports in L.A. history? Well, when I got to Los Angeles, it was 1966. Tommy was still a minor league manager, and he continued in that role, had some offers to go elsewhere, but his, his design was to be one day the manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, so he stayed with them, coached, worked under Walt Olson until December of 1976 when Walt retired and Tommy got the job. I got to know Tommy a little bit, not much, when he was a coach. And we've said this together over the years. Tommy and I started the same year. Tommy's the manager, me as the broadcaster, which was 1977. And we were fortunate enough that the Dodgers won the pennant in both 1977, 1978, and 1981. I'll never forget that one time in the fall, I had to fly to New York to go to a meeting of the NFL play-by-play -play announcers for NBC, and on the plane out of LAX, I sat with Dick Enberg. Dick was going back to New York for a meeting, but we got to talking, and he said, Ross, you really don't know how lucky you are. First five years with the Dodgers, you were in three World Series. He said, you know, I spent nine years broadcasting the Angel games, some of those with Drysdale, and in nine years, I never had a September where they were the Angels were ever in the pennant race. You just don't know how lucky you are. And, of course, uh, he was right. Yesterday, we, when we were talking on the phone, we talked about, uh, briefly about how I think he said you had to do it where you would call a game, but you weren't at the game. Yes. That was really prevalent back in the 1950s. There's something called recreation. The play-by-play -play announcer would not go to the side of the game. He would stay back in his station studio. The station would bring in a telegraph operator, I guess you'd call it that, not a Western Union, but he would set up his equipment and what they would do is they would have somebody, one of his colleagues in that business, be at the ballpark in the press box and that person would then send across what was going on in the game and it was called recreation. So what you would do is you would, if the game started at say, I'd say 7.30, the game itself, 7.30 baseball, minor league baseball in this case, you would wait and not come on the air with your recreation till 7.45. You wanted to be behind the actual play so you didn't catch up and have nothing to say. And that usually worked. And what it was, uh, was that, that the operator would, Make it very simple on for us on the other end. 
he would send it in and he'd say, let's see, we've got uh, Jones. Jones is leading off. Jones is at the plate. B1, uh, ball one. S1, strike one. Jo- Jones, ground ball out to shortstop. And so you would then take it from there and create the play-by-play yourself. And it was done even at the national level. They did it, I think, uh, they had uh, the Liberty Broadcasting System do it for a while. And it was, it was something that was being done. And a couple of stories about that. In my case, I was not doing the game. It was before I started doing the game. But there was a, a night where Shawnee played in Paris, Texas. And they were recreating. And they got along and were moving right along. And suddenly the machine broke. It was bringing in all the information on the wire. And the play-by-play announcer in Shawnee could see he was catching up. And pretty soon he was within one or two batters of the last man that they had any kind of information on. And he came up with one of the best ideas I've ever heard. He saw he was going to be in trouble. And so he suddenly said, oh, my gosh, look at the lightning out behind the left field fence. Oh, yeah, I can smell rain. And within a couple of seconds, he said, oh, it started to rain here. And uh, they're going to have to cover the field. And so we'll have a delay, and we'll be back with you when the, the rain stops and we can continue the game. So finally, they got the, the machine fixed, and it started again with the recreation, and the guy came back on the air and finished the game. <laughs> a friend of mine is a sports editor in Shawnee. After the game, he called the sports editor at Paris, Texas, to get the box score of the game. And he said to him, gosh, I guess you guys really had a rainstorm down there, didn't you? The guy said, rain? We haven't had rain in eight months. (laughs) And the other story, and you know this, Mike, because we talked about it, President Reagan, the the later President Reagan, uh, after he got out of college, was a sportscaster and went to WHO in Des Moines, Iowa, which was a powerful 50,000-watt station. And they recreated the Chicago Cubs games. And he found himself one day in a similar situation. He was doing a game and the machine broke and about to catch up with him. (laughs) And what happened was he had a batter at the plate. The machine was broken. He had the batter foul off 16 consecutive pitches (laughs) until they got the machine fixed. And that that was a great story in itself. I remember too, and something else we discussed a weekend that was beyond human endurance, (laughs) for lack of a better word, where it seems like no matter what time of the day or night I turned on the radio, you were calling a game. (laughs) Uh, For history's sake, it was August 23rd, 1989. The Dodgers were playing the Expos in Montreal. It was the final leg of a three-city swing to the east. We'd gone to New York and Philadelphia before going to Montreal. Vin was with us in New York and Philadelphia because the games were televised. But because it was going to be radio only in Montreal, he went back to Los Angeles after the first two cities. Don Drysdale and I went to Montreal to do radio only. And we did game one. We did game two, and right after game two, Don got word that his wife Annie had gone into labor, and so he said, I got to get home. So it was left for me to do game three by myself, and my wife was with me on the trip, and we went out to the Olympic Stadium that night, walked in the press box, and As usual, to my left, the French-speaking announcers of the Expos. To my right, the Spanish-speaking announcers of the Dodgers. I was the only announcer there that was doing the game in English. Someone said later, what would have happened if you had gotten ill or something? I said, Lynn would have had her first debut as a Major League Baseball announcer. So we sat there. She was in the front row with me. She was reading a book on the Lennon sisters. 
And I think that night she was able either to, to finish the entire book or get very close to the end of it. So the game started, and it's nothing, nothing for six innings, seven innings. Lynn wrote me a note, said, can I get you a Coke? I wrote back and said, no, I wouldn't have time to go to the bathroom. So the game went on. Zero, zero, 12 innings, 14 innings, 16th inning. Montreal loads the bases, one out. Fly ball to right, it's caught. Guy on third tags, comes home. Game over. Montreal players celebrate. Wait a minute. Dodgers on the bench said, he left early. The runner at third, he left early. So the Dodgers appealed, threw the ball to third base, and the umpire Bob Davidson said, he left early, he's out, double play, keep the game going. So we had went to the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st. Nothing, nothing. In the 22nd inning, Rick Dempsey, who had taken over the catching job in the middle innings for Mike Sosha, came to the plate. And on the mound for Montreal was one of the best pitchers in baseball at the time, Dennis Martinez. They brought him in in relief. The irony was that Rick Dempsey had caught Dennis Martinez in some glory years in Baltimore. Dempsey had had one home run all year. Martinez threw him a pitch, and Rick hit a line drive to left field and I think cleared the fence by maybe 18 inches. That gave the Dodgers a one to nothing lead. In the bottom of the 22nd inning, Rex Hudler got on base for Montreal with two out to left field. He decided to try to steal second. Dempsey threw him out. The game was over. Six hours, 14 minutes, and they checked and found out that that was the longest play-by-play by one announcer in Major League history. And so I still today am proud to hold that honor. Well, you probably didn't have any trouble sleeping that night, did you? Well, the interesting thing, Mike, was that it was the last night of the road trip, and we had to fly home. And so we got on the plane like, what, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had to refuel, I think, in Kansas City. So the time we got home, it was probably 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning in L.A. And I remember that on that flight home, I had my transistor radio and put it up to my ear at one point late in the flight. And they said, Baseball Commissioner Mark Giamatti has just suspended Pete Rose for life. And interesting that that would occur that night. Of all the games you called... Who's the best player you ever saw, you think, all around? That's a very good question. I've always said the best hitter that I ever saw was Tony Gwynn. Tony with the Padres, his whole career, and he won eight National League batting championships. He was a delight to watch because he he knew the game so well. And I think he wound up with like a 338 lifetime batting average. Now, I have to qualify that by saying, at that time, there were no interleague games. So I never saw George Brett. I never saw some of the other American League hitters. So it's hard to, to make a comparison and say, this guy was better because I just simply don't know. And I think also when I think about it, Mike, and you might be in the same vein as I am, When we were growing up, we had players that we thought were the best ever, whatever it was, in baseball. And it's so hard to compare eras. And so who is to say that that Willie Mays was the best player ever? Vin says Willie Mays was the best player he ever saw. But we didn't see Ted Williams. But the the list just goes on and on, and I don't know how you compare and say this guy was better than this guy. Do you have anything, uh, the most memorable play you ever saw? Wow. Yes, yes, I'll I'll tell you what. what, It was a series of uh, it was a series of at bats. It was the 1977 World Series, Dodgers and the Yankees. And I was assigned (laughs) to broadcast the games on CBS 
the games in New York. Dodgers played at Yankee Stadium. And guys, they had like 600 stations on, on the CBS network that heard those games. And uh, in game six, Yankees were heading the series three games to two. And Reggie Jackson came up. He hit the first pitch for a home run. Hit it off of uh, Bert Hooten. Next time he came up, Charlie Huff was on the mound. He hit Charlie's first pitch for a home run. Next time he came up, Elias Sosa was pitching. He hit his first pitch for a home run. He had also homered on the last at bat the game before. So he'd hit four home runs on four first pitches in the World Series. And I got to announce those at Yankee Stadium. And that was, that was a big thrill. In fact, they took my play-by-play and made that one of, I think they called it the 50 greatest calls in sports history. Bob Costas did a, an album on that. So I remember that very, very well. There was a, another momentous Dodger occasion with a home run in the World Series that I seem to recall. Uh, do you have a take on that? I think you're referring, Mike, to the 1988 World Series, the game one, the Dodgers and the A's. That year, the Dodgers were not considered to be a, even a pennant contender. They were picked by some people to finish fourth in the National League West. But they won the West. And they wound up going against the New York Mets in the National League Championship Series. Now, during the year, the teams had played 11 games. The Mets had won 10 of the 11. One got rained out, never made up. So everybody said, well, the Mets will just bully the Dodgers and win that easy. Well, they didn't. The Dodgers had a great series came from behind in that series and won it in seven games. That put them in the World Series. Well, again, the odds makers and all of the experts said there's no way the Dodgers can beat the Oakland A's. After all, Oakland has had 104, 105 wins. They've got uh, Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco, Dennis Eckersley, whole list of great players. Well, they were surprised. Dodgers came out, and in game one that you're referring to, the A's took a four to three lead to the bottom of the ninth inning. My assignment that night was to do the, pre, the post game interview. So I left our broadcast booth, top of the ninth inning, to go downstairs to the Dodger Clubhouse and just wait for the end of the game and pick somebody to do the interview. And honestly, I had to think about who I was going to choose because it looked like Oakland was going to win especially when they brought Dennis Eckersley in from the Oakland bullpen. I mean, he had been really untouchable all year long. And when I got down to the uh, dressing room, uh, Kurt Gibson, who had not been able to play, was seated on the training table and with his shirt off, his uniform pants on, and above him was a television monitor. And about that time, Vin said to Joe Garagiola on the NBC telecast, Joe, there's one guy that we won't see tonight for sure because he can barely walk, and that's Kirk Gibson. When Gibson heard that, he yelled, Mitch, come here, Mitch. Mitch Poole was the clubhouse attendant for the Dodgers. Mitch showed up, and he said, Mitch, you go tell Lasorda I can hit. So – Pulled, went down to the dugout. About two minutes later, he came back. He said, Lasorda told me to tell you to get dressed, but whatever you do, don't show yourself. He doesn't want Tony and Rosa, who was the manager of the A's, to know that you're available. So Gibson got dressed, and he went out to the, the batting net outside the uh, training room, put like a wiffle ball on the, on the tee, took about eight or ten swings. And somebody leaned around the corner and said to him, okay, Gibby, you can come out now. So I followed him down the tunnel to the field. 
Now, Lasorda at that time was really in trouble because there were two out, nobody on base. Mike Davis was the batter. And just to make sure that he could go through with his, his secret plan, Tommy put Dave Anderson in the on-deck circle as he was going to be the pinch hitter if Davis got on and kept the game going. Well, Davis had not had a good year. And one thing he never did was walk. He was swinging all the time. Davis had played with Eckersley in Oakland. And a couple of those years, Davis had hit 20 or 22 home runs. And Eckersley knew of his power. And so he pitched him away. And he had him in a hole, 0-2, 1-2. He wound up walking him, of all things. How he walked Davis, nobody knows. But he's at first. And when Davis walked, here came Gibson up the steps. Crowd went bonkers, bonkers. I'm looking out from the corner of the third base dugout over the right field bullpen, and all I can see are red brake lights on cars leaving the stadium so they could beat the traffic. And Gibson goes up the plate, and he fouls off a couple. He's in a hole 0-2. And And Davis, during that at-bat, And people don't remember this. I didn't either for a long time. Davis stole second base. If he gets thrown out, Gibson never finishes his at bat. The Dodgers lose the game, and Gibson is never known for his famous home run. Anyway, the count went to three balls, two strikes. Before the game, the Dodgers advanced scout, wonderful man, Mel Didier had been following Oakland for two or three weeks, taking down notes on all of the players, things that happened in the game. And before game one that night, he had called the hitters together, and during his observations to them, he said, guys, he had a Louisiana accent, so he said, partner, partners, I want to tell you something. If Eckersley ever gets you three and two, you can bet your last dollar he's going to throw you a backdoor slider. So when Gibson got the count to three and two, he stepped out of the batter's box and he remembered what Mel said. He stepped back in. Here came the three, two pitch back door slider. And all of us remember Gibson took what looked like a one handed swing and hit the home run. It was the only bet Gibson had in that world series. And the Dodgers beat the A's in five games. I'll bet you every L.A. fan remembers what Vin said, too. Yeah, Vin said in the year of the improbable, the impossible has happened. And that was all he said. He, he, I think it was, what, two minutes of just the crowd cheering? Yeah, yeah. Jack Buck was on radio, and Jack made, I think, one of the great calls, too, that I've ever heard a baseball announcer make. Gibson's ball wound up in the seats for a home run. And Jack said, I can't believe what I just saw. That's probably the most memorable baseball event in my life. Well, you know, they, uh, they have, I think, what they call the Los Angeles Sports Council. And a couple of years ago, they did, I don't know whether they did a poll or whether they just had the experts talk, but they ranked Gibson's home run as the number one event all time in Los Angeles sports history. I believe it. I agree. Ross, would you consider doing a recreation of a play just off the top of your head? On this 23rd night of August here in 1989, there's some ball game in Montreal. Hard to believe, folks, but we are nothing, nothing as we go to the 22nd inning at Olympic Stadium, and we're coming up on the six-hour mark in this ball game. Now coming off the bench is Rick Dempsey. He'll be at the plate here in a moment, and from the bullpen of the Expos comes, <laughs> of all people, Dennis Martinez. You know, Dennis Martinez and Rick Dempsey were teammates in Baltimore for years, and now here they are going head-to-head in this ball game tonight in Canada. First pitch. Dempsey takes high for a ball. To count one ball, no strikes. Expos thought they'd won the game in the 16th inning on a sacrifice fly, but the umpire ruled the runner on third left early, and here we are again six innings later. 
Martinez into the windup and the next pitch. There's a line drive to left field. Is it deep enough? Going back at the wall, it is gone. Home run for Rick Dempsey, and the Dodgers take a one to nothing lead here in the 22nd inning. For Dempsey, only his second home run of this season. Great. That was really good. Could I get you to do one more? Yeah. This one will really be created. I kind of brought it up. Sandy Koufax pitching to Babe Ruth. Oh, okay. All right. Here we are in the ninth inning. The Dodgers are one out away from a one to nothing victory over the Yankees. Sandy Koufax working on a two hitter, but he's got a big challenge ahead of him because here comes the Bambino, Babe Ruth, one of the great power hitters of all time. Koufax ready into the windup, and the first pitch is swung on and missed. That's strike one to Ruth. Ruth, tremendous power hitter. Ruth steps out for a moment. Now back in waiting. Koufax leans in, gets the sign, into the windup. Here's the pitch. It swung on and missed. Strike two. So Koufax jumps ahead of Ruth with a count no balls and two strikes. Now will Sandy try to fool him, or will he go right after him with that fastball, which is up at 96 miles per hour? We'll know in a moment. Ruth waits. Here comes the pitch. He struck him out swinging, and the Dodgers hold on and beat the Yankees one to nothing as a perfecto by Sandy Koufax gets the job done. Listening to all your stories, is there any sport you didn't call? Yeah, I never did hockey. That's uh, it? <laughs> yeah, I never did hockey. I worked one year at the Ben Crosby Golf Tournament. I did tennis, high school tennis, on that uh, high school show we did. Football, basketball, baseball. We haven't talked about my years of doing college basketball, but I was very fortunate to do that for, gosh, 15 years or so. That's another record you hold, college basketball and baseball, isn't it? I think. The last time I checked, I was the only announcer to have broadcast the games of a World Series champion and an NCAA basketball tournament champion because I did the UNLV team in 1990 when they beat Duke. I think it was 103 to 73 in the finals in Denver. And that was great. I did, I did uh, UNLV basketball for, I believe it was 14 or 15 years. And, of course, they had some terrific teams. And it was fun to do that. I did that on, on radio. I did it on television. That was really exciting because I love basketball. I know you like statistics and numbers, and this one might not be something that you would have on the tip of your tongue, but how many hours of TV and how many hours of radio have you done in your life? I couldn't tell you that, Mike. I did do a little bit of figuring when I left the Dodgers. And I came up with a figure of having announced between 4,500 and 5,000 Dodger baseball games, 28 years. And at the same time, I figured up that I was away from my wife for nine years when you count two-week road trips, spring training, things like that. I guess that makes her the unsung hero in this whole thing, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, she is. <laughs> We've been married come June 60 years. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Well, one more thing I'd like to say to you. Just, I talked about my dad and, and what a sports fan he was. And one night when I, I think I was maybe 11 years old or 12, he took me to a Shawnee High School football game one night on a Friday night. We were walking up the steps, and we got about halfway up, and there was a fellow seated on the aisle with blankets all around him. He could barely distinguish who he was. And dad saw him and stopped and said, oh, hi, Jim. I'd like you to meet my son. Jim, this is my son, Ross Jr. Ross, this is Jim Thorpe. So you did get to meet the greatest athlete of all time. That's right. And... 
My dad then was a pallbearer at his funeral, and he led the drive to get the Jim Thorpe Museum placed in Shawnee, and he had it all done, and the governor of Oklahoma told him that, uh, yeah, no problem, and when it got to his desk, he vetoed the money, and Jim Thorpe's widow took him to Pennsylvania, and that was a big blow for my dad, but uh, they, it was then called... But, later called Jim Thorpe Stadium. When I moved to Oregon in the mid-90s, the Dodgers seemed to just have a tight organization, always saying every seemed, everything went right. It just it seems like everything went wrong after oh, about 96, 97. The only thing, Mike, that I can think of in that period was the fact that they had relied on their farm system for so many years and been so successful doing it. And suddenly they had a dark spell where they were not drafting well. And I, I, did, I did a little research on that within the recent months too. And it was astonishing how many of their first round draft choices never panned out. It, it was like 85% of the people that they drafted in the first round never got to, to, they might have gotten to the Dodgers, but they didn't do anything to help them. And there was a figure there in my mind. I want to say they have 67 first round draft choices all time. And they've only had like 10 or 12 of those players uh, become not only starters, but fellows who were really, instrumental in their victories and it took them a long time to get that built back up and i think that when they did that they started to bring in the, the players and of course they had what was it five consecutive rookies of the year but that took you into the 70s and 80s and it was it was a long time. Well, it seemed like they went, well, they went through a lot of owners. They went through a lot of managers. There seemed to be not a whole lot of continuity to the team. Yeah, they did. They, uh, they did. They had a, a series of new general managers, new field managers, and they changed farm directors. They had a lot of things going on. There's one more story I'd like to tell you. Please. Some years ago, at church one day, a fellow came up to me and said, I've got a question to ask you. I said, sure. He said, I know of a young man who is a great baseball fan. He has a terminal illness. He's like 22 years old. We don't want to give him an autographed baseball, an autographed bat, can you think of anything that might be done for this young man? I said, let me think about it. So I did. And I called Mike Socia, who was managing the Angels. It was the middle of his season. I explained the situation to Mike. I said, would you go with me to see this young man? He said, sure, Ross. What time do you want me ready? So I went out and picked him up. We drove about 12 miles to the, the home of, of the young man. And he had all of his family there at his bedside. They all had cameras. They all took pictures of Mike. And this kid was really knowledgeable. He would second guess Mike on some of the calls that he made and strategy he made. And so we spent about 45 minutes and the boy just question after question. Mike was the usual patient, wonderful Mike Socia. And so we posed for pictures. We left, we got in the car. Mike said, you know, Ross, I got more out of that than he did. We were told later by his family that after we left, the boy said to his mother, and he was so exhilarated by Socia's visit, he said, Mom, will you take me to the beach? Well, he'd not been out of bed for months. 
So they, she said, of course. So they took him to the beach, enjoyed the day at the beach. A month later, he died. And that family will never, ever forget what Mike Sosha did. No one, no one except me and that family will ever know what Sosha did on a day off during his season to make that trip to see the boy. And it just says something about the character of Mike Sosha. After you left the Dodgers, you've had a couple of new projects. One of them, I think, takes up a lot of your time. You've been doing events every year for a while now, and you are getting ready to come up with one. And and you'll be working on it in the future, I'm sure. What's What can you tell us about the event, the events you've done before, and the organization that you're helping? Thank you, Mike, for giving us that opportunity. Our son is a clinical psychologist. His first child was born with Down syndrome. And he and his wife started an organization called Still Point Family Resources. And it's a nonprofit. And they have done marvelous work for many years, helping families with special needs, children, and then branched out. And they've been very much of a a positive force with abused women, teens at risk, and so on. And we've had a charity golf tournament for 14 years. And during that time, I'm happy to say that we've had 95 different personalities either play in our tournament or come to our dinners. And the list is just, just great. And my friends who've been in sports and entertainment have backed us completely. Unfortunately, this year, of course, we couldn't do it because of COVID-19. But in place of that, we're going to have a, what would you call a special night, a virtual night that's coming up on Saturday, this Saturday, November 14th at 7 o'clock. And on there, you're going to see special videos of the program narrated by Vin Scully. You're going to see a preview of an interview I did with Vin that has never been seen. 21 minutes. And I think it's the best interview I've ever done with anybody. And Vin has given us permission to show that. Now, we're not going to show the full thing this week, but we will in, in the weeks ahead and, and open it up for people to see it as well. There are also going to be auction, 30 items, a lot of sports memorabilia, many things that people can bid on. We invite them to join us. I think the best way to do it is to go to be a Zoom link on the website. And the website is still point familyresources.org. For several years now, at the Still Point Family Resources Golf Tournament, we've put together for the live auction that night an opportunity for people who are big Dodger fans to come and have lunches with Ben Scully, Tommy Lasorda, Peter O'Malley, and it's been very successful. Well, Ross, I'd sure like to thank you for taking the time with us. We're all going to watch the event tonight. Thanks again. I've enjoyed it. I'm going to watch this myself many times. And hopefully we can do something again sometime. Be happy to do it, Mike. Really enjoyed being with you. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share some of the stories. It's, it's been a great deal. Thanks, Ross.